Thank you and welcome. Let me just say, uh, this is kind of ironic that I am your dinner speaker. I don't know how many people out there had problems at the dinner table, but dinner was kind of the time in my family where everybody got together, and that's where the fuel and the gasoline and everything got together. So in my recovery, dinner time has been sacred. So I would like to have everybody raise a glass. Recovery happens. Cheers, everybody. I am a marriage and family therapist, licensed by the state of California, and I presently work with Kaiser Permanente in their addiction medicine department. So to talk a little bit about my background to start off with, uh, growing up here in Southern California, like so many other kids, I wanted to grow up to be an actor. And this is something that I wanted to do from the time I was about three years old. And I got very involved in community theater when I was in junior high school, did a lot of high school stuff, a lot of college stuff. But I started going to auditions, and there would be 150 guys that looked just like me. So I got disillusioned, and about the time that I got disillusioned, I started doing some traveling. And through my travels, I had a lot of experiences that really kind of changed my focus and changed the things that I wanted to do in my life. I met a lot of people along the way that touched my heart and had a lot of changes. And I'm going to kind of intertwine some of the stories with some of the things I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. One of the groups of people that I met along the way We're the Pennsylvania Dutch. I saw the movie Witness, and I was fascinated by these people and didn't think they existed. So through different people in my journeys telling the story that I wanted to meet these people, I actually have been adopted by three families in the Pennsylvania Dutch community. And it's amazing that I could go to school to learn about marriage and family therapy, but no one ever shows you or tells you what a functioning family looks like. That is something I learned through my, my Pennsylvania Dutch friends, and I owe them a lot of gratitude for the experiences that I've had with them. And I've known them for almost 30 years now. I go back almost every year to visit, and I've seen the second generation of their kids grow up. So a lot of thanks and gratitude for them because they helped show me the way. They are today my family. So I changed my major when I came back from my traveling, and I went into human services. And the, the school I went to, Cal State Fullerton, they had me do three semesters of internship. And I ended up in a nonprofit organization in Orange County where I was working with teenagers in a clinic-based program as well as on-site at a couple different high schools. And I was really fortunate. As a junior in college, they allowed me to do therapy with these kids, which I don't know why they trusted me. And then they also let me design a summer recreation program. Bless you where we rode our bicycles halfway to the Grand Canyon and hiked down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And one of the things that we did in the program, uh, we do campouts where we do uh, two, three times a year, we'd go up to the Kern River and we'd do inner tubing, we'd do mountain biking, and uh, we would do line dancing. <laughs> this is back in the 90s. And a lot of the kids thought they were big and bad and, and kind of above doing this. But it was really about mastery. It was really about them feeling inadequate about themselves. And it was amazing when the first kid got all the steps to the line dance down. All of a sudden, that kid could teach the next, next kid and so on and so on. And you had this, this group of kids that felt so good about themselves. So I worked with the teenagers for about six years until the county had this wonderful idea that the funding could go somewhere else. So we all lost our jobs, and my agency got funding to open a residential center for heroin addicts with HIV, and originally they asked me if I wanted to take on that program. And I had opened up a previous facility years before, and those people scared me. They were all tattooed, missing teeth, they had broken noses. I, I, I did not know how to identify with this program. But after two months of looking for work, 
uh, I decided to give it a try. And the amazing thing is, everything I did with my teenagers worked beautifully with these people. What I learned is these people were nothing more than teenagers. They just had more years to practice at it. And with this, I did a lot of inner child work. And I ended up getting my license and running three programs in Orange County until we lost funding. County's kind of funny how the funds come and go. And I needed to get transferred a little bit farther from home, and I didn't want the extra commute, so hence I got the job at Kaiser, where I've been for about 10 and a half years now, and I've been very happy there working in their addiction medicine department. I primarily deal with the chronic relapsers, and I deal with the inner child, because one of the reasons people keep relapsing is because they don't deal with the core issues. And I look at therapy kind of like if you have uh, an abscess, you have a, uh, a staph infection, say, in your arm, and you have this thing that's going to kill you with the poison sooner or later if you don't have it tended to. And that's what comes in when people are, are in denial and, and they're just breaking through their denial and they're starting to realize the hurting that they have. And when you go to the doctor and you have this, this, this horrible, painful thing, for the doctor to help you, they've got to cut it open and they've got to clean the, the wound out. And it hurts. It hurts a lot. And when you're done and you're all sewed back up again, you're left with a scar. But I have to tell you, the scar can't kill you like the infection could. So the challenge I give to all my patients is to learn how to take that scar and turn it into a trophy of courage. So the solution, we all know what the solution is. I'm going to give you my spin on the solution. The solution is to become your own loving parent. The solution to get past your childhood pain is the choice to challenge your belief system and create a new today for yourself. The solution is to shield yourself with a shield of love. The solution is to take a time out to breathe, and to focus. The solution is to take God's hand and let him walk you through the storm. The solution is to take assistance and once in a while ask for some help. The solution is to remove judgment because without judgment, you can't have shame or fear. The solution is to play with all your heart and all your soul even if it means dancing in the rain. And I'm hoping we get a little bit of rain at the end of this thing. And the solution is to fake it till you make it. Easier said than done. Okay? So here's the big roadblock that we get with everybody. So most of the people go through life hurting, but they're not aware that they're hurting. They're, they're, they're ignorantly bliss until something happens where they hit bottom. And we all know about that. Everybody in here probably is at bottom, and that's why you're in this room. So the process is to go from hurting to healing to helping. But it's hard because when you're hurting, you're brought up in a family that tells you, don't talk don't feel, don't trust. And what do you think we ask you to do when you walk into a 12-step meeting or you walk into a therapy session? You know, give me what you got. Tell me everything. You know, and doing an intake, I'm really clear. This is an information gathering session. I need to get all this information. And I realize half of what people tell me isn't the whole picture. I realize that. It's really, 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 really hard because I'm breaking the rule. I'm breaking the don't talk, don't trust, don't feel rule. So people come into therapy, come into 12 steps with that. Also, if you grew up in a family where there was a critical voice, your parents might not even be around anymore. But you still hear their critical voice. Sometimes the critical voice says, you don't need 12 step, you don't need, you can do this on your own. Why, why are you so messed up that you need this? You know, you don't have to do this. A lot of times we are afraid to come in because we're afraid that we are going to be disloyal to our family. As screwed up as they might be, they are everything to us. And for us to talk 
say something that might be ill about our parents, it hurts too much. Because after all, they are our link to the world, and if we talk bad about them, you know, they're not going to love us. That's the ultimate rejection right there. And a lot of times, as an adult, we look back and we say, they did the best they could. How many people have ever gotten to that point where they look at their parents and they say they did the best they could? The problem with that is that's your adult mind. Your little inner child still stomps his feet and has temper tantrums at times. I'm going to talk a minute about defining moments. Defining moments are the, the things that happen in our life that change us. In working the, the fourth step of ACA, doing your laundry list inventory, that is coming up with your defining moments. And I think defining moments are kind of like tinting your sunglasses. If you grow up in a world where everything is wonderful, you see the world clearly. However, when you grow up in a world where there's dysfunction, that becomes the tint on your sunglasses of which you see the world. So you could say, my parents did the best they could. And then your boss calls you into your off their office one day. And because you process things through the area of which you were abused, maybe from, from, from this high, you don't think, what does my boss want to talk about? You think, holy crap, what did I do now? What's going on with me? Or if you are rebellious, you go in there with your dukes up. They have nothing on me. I'm going to go in there, you know, I'm prepared. I'm, I'm ready for the fight. It's not about your parents. They did the best they could. So this is where the healing has to happen. The healing can't happen in the adult. It has to happen in the inner child. Recently, I was invited into uh, a friend of mine's home. I grew up with a friend um, in my local neighborhood. Hadn't seen him since sixth grade. Reconnected a couple years ago on Facebook and actually have become much better friends nowadays with his sister. And I was driving by the old neighborhood a couple months ago, and his mother was out in front, and I hadn't seen her in over 40 years. So I stopped the car, ran out, said hello to her. She invited me into the house. It was a wonderful reunion, but it was interesting because I looked around the room and I said, this room is much smaller than I remember it to be. Okay? Our perception changes when we get older, but the original perception and the original rooms are, are as they are. So that's why we have to go to that point to heal them. Another thing that keeps us from healing is fear. A lot of people have fear in losing their identity. I was in a college class years ago, and the teacher asked for a, a, a volunteer and went up to the student and said, I'm going to wave a magic wand over your head, and all your issues are going to go away in an instant. She had a panic attack right there in the middle of the class. Stop! She says, don't do that. I have no idea. Tears coming down her face. I have no idea who I would be if you took away all my dysfunction. Okay? We're afraid of discovering who we are. The secret for you guys, you can be whoever you want to be. That's the cool thing about recovery. You've got to move past that fear. Some people have the fear of change. Some people have the fear of losing the family's loyalty. You know, I'm not going to spend Christmas with you this year because you guys are crazy, you guys drink too much, so I'm going to spend Christmas somewhere else. The fear that your family is going to cut you off okay, keeps us immobilized. Loss of our identity, loss of our affiliations. Gee, so if I get sober, does this mean I can't hang out with my friends at the bar anymore? Does this mean that, um, you know, my, my best friend's my connection? How am, I, how am I going to spend my, my, my Saturday nights if I'm not, you know, at the bowling alley with a beer in my hand? You know, there's so much fear about losing your affiliations. Okay? You've got to walk through the fear. And then another thing that I come up with often, I call it program is exclusivity. Program exclusivity. That's where some people say, you don't need ACA. You don't need therapy. You just need AA. You just need to work the 12 steps. You work the 12 steps. You don't even need psychiatry. Throw your pills out. You don't need them. If you work the steps, you will be happy. That's all you need. And that's a roadblock for healing. And what else is that? It's a critical voice. 
We don't need more critical voices in our head telling us what not to do, okay? Especially when it's a command and it's telling us, okay? We need to get past that. And I'm the rebel where I work, and this is one of the reasons why I was asked to be a guest speaker tonight. I believe that ACA is important for people in therapy. Most people come into therapy not because things that just happened to them, but things that just happened to them that trigger past emotions and past events. They've done studies, and people that have had traumas as adults that have not had traumas as children get through it very good. They're very resilient. It's the past traumas that, that, that come up that have to be healed with. So I'm the rebel. And I tell everybody, AA reminds you, no matter what, don't drink. NA, no matter what, don't use. ACA reminds us, no matter what, we're in therapy. And therapy doesn't happen when you're in session. Therapy happens between sessions. So this is where ACA really comes in handy with therapy, with working your steps, because it helps keep us on track for the healing. Okay. So we really need that to move forward. So people come into therapy, they start 12 steps. The first step, I think, in moving out of hurting into healing is education. I think education is so freeing for some people to realize that you don't have to hold on to your belief system forever. Belief systems aren't always good, they're not always bad, but they don't always work for you as an adult. And sometimes when you can challenge yourself and you can find irrational belief, like I have no evidence that my boss is going to fire me when I'm called into the office. Maybe my boss needs a favor. Maybe my boss wants to give me a promotion and ask me if I'm interested. I don't know. So I would rather stop that thought process in recovery, we call it thoughts, feelings, urges, actions. In cognitive behavioral therapy, we call it activating event, belief, consequence, dispute, effective outcome, future influence. Same thing. We educate people with this. One of the things that I teach my patients in every single group is to do a cognitive reframe, which is you take a recent negative thought, could be minor, holy crap, I missed my light, I'm going to be late. Or it could be something catastrophic. I haven't heard from my kids and they were supposed to be home an hour ago. Take that negative thought and put a positive spin on it. If you don't have any evidence, you can't believe it the way it is in your head. Put a positive spin. I missed the light. It's okay. I can wait here. I can catch my breath. I can enjoy being in this moment. And when the light changes, I can move on. I haven't heard from my kids yet, but you know what? I haven't got a bad call either. Maybe, maybe their phone died. Maybe they got caught in the rain, you know. I need to turn this around. And it's amazing when people can turn this around, the difference it makes. Had a woman years ago whose negative thoughts, her core beliefs were that she could not do anything right. It was something that was just so terrifying for her when anybody criticized her. This woman was in her 60s. And I asked her, when did you learn that you could never do anything right? probably can all guess what she said. When I was five years old, my mother said so. Okay? Let's challenge this belief. Let's look at the opposite. What proof do you have that maybe you have become successful? I retired early. I have a great marriage. I live in a great condo high over the, the ocean. I've got a great view. Kids love me. Grandkids love me. Very active at church. Still connected to my old job. I'm a, I'm a consultant. It's like, wow, and what part of yourself still wants to believe that you'd never amount to anything? Okay? That was a new defining moment for that woman. She came up to me three months later and said, I have to tell you, I was flying somewhere with my grandkid. We missed our connecting flight. My first thought, negative. Holy crap, my family's waiting for me at the other end, and they're going to be pissed at me for missing my flight positive spin. I got to the airport on time. I checked in on time. I got on my plane on time. The airlines screwed up. If my family wants to be upset, they're welcome to be upset, but not at me. She said, that's the time I would have gone to the bar. I grabbed my kid and we went and we got an ice cream cone. Effective outcome. That's the power of education here. Now I realize asking people to don't talk, don't feel, don't trust is going against every fiber of your being. 
I'm somewhat afraid of heights, and I know where I got it from. Does anybody here remember Bush Gardens in, in uh, the valley? They had a monorail. I was a kid, probably four or five years old, on the monorail. As soon as it took out of the station, my mother had a major panic attack. She's on the floor of the monorail, screaming at the guy, please, stop, stop, make it stop, make it go back. Tears, hysterics. And I remember the poor guy operating the thing says, I'm sorry, lady, it only goes forward. You know, we can, we can stop halfway. There's a place you can get off, but it, this, is, this is the best I can do. We learn from our parents. We learn attitude from our parents. So I, I think my mom kind of messed me up in that moment. Uh, years ago, I wanted to hike to the top of Half Dome, so I actually did a lot of things to try to get past my fear, including going up with a friend who had a two-seater ultralight. After he stalled it the third time, I said, I get it. You don't have to show me anymore that you know how to pull out of a stall. I get it. So I've done half to them, I've done it three times. However, I was in Costa Rica a couple years ago, and I wanted to do some zip lining. And I'm harnessed onto the zip lining, and I was with a group of friends, and with our group there was this other family from Denmark, the, the Jorgensons. And we went first down the zip lining, and I was the last in the group. And they harnessed me up, and the guy just said, okay, step off the platform. As a therapist, that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to blindly go against every fiber of your being and step off the platform. I know I couldn't do it. I took a deep breath, and every ounce of my being just said, you can't step off of a platform 20 feet above a jungle. You just can't do it. So I just looked at the guy, and I said, I'm sorry, senor. You're going to have to unhook me. I just can't do it. So I walked away. And I knew that I would regret that moment forever being in Costa Rica and not doing this. And I thought, I teach this crap. How come I can't follow the stuff that I'm teaching? I've got to have something in my bag of tricks that I can pull into to get me to do this. And I remembered that year before that, I was at Magic Mountain, and there's this wonderful attraction there called Devil Dive. Has anybody done Devil Dive? It's this thing you pay extra for, and they harness you and two of your friends together and hoist you up this tower 150 feet on a cable, and then somebody pulls the trigger and you just drop and swing. Afraid of heights here? 10-year-old, 11-year-old, come on, let's do this. How could I say no to a 10-year-old and 11-year-old, okay? So my friends are watching the freaking video afterwards, and they're like, what are you saying? We see you going up there, and you're just talking the whole time. It's like, well, I wanted to say, am I crazy? What am I doing? But I didn't want to freak these kids out. I didn't want to give these kids what my mother gave me, right? So what am I saying up there? Oh, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Look what you're doing. You're doing what it took me 50 years to do. And luckily, I didn't have the control on the tab because I couldn't have done it. We would have been stuck up there. The 11-year-old did it, thank God. And we dropped. And the first millisecond is just total sheer panic. But then the rope catches you and you swing, and it feels just like, like your Peter Pan. It's wonderful. So I told myself back in Costa Rica, if I can get through the first millisecond, I will be okay. That was the bag of tricks I got. So I went back up to the platform, and I told the guy, I can't guarantee I'm going to do it, but I do want to try. Please hook me up again. He hooked me up, and instead of stepping off the platform, I did a reality check. I leaned back. I felt the taut rope, and I felt like I was sitting in a swing. And I realized, I can do this sitting in a chair. And I took the leap of faith, and I stepped off the platform. Okay? So we want you to get to the point where you can take that leap of faith and step off the platform. And my friends were saying, they were so waiting for me at the other end, they had their cameras ready, and there's this pause, and all of a sudden, here comes Mrs. Jorgensen. So they were happy about 10 minutes later when they said they heard me screaming and they knew I was coming. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things that I like to do as a therapist to get people that have a hard time stepping off the platform to do it gradually. I had somebody in group recently and chronic relapser had been through several programs, never really been able to get it. Fairly young person angry at his mother, let's do a role play. Pick somebody to be your mother. As he's doing this role play, he 
could, you could just see the intensity of his emotions building. At one point, he's like, Ken, we need to stop this. I need a cigarette. No, that's stuffing your feelings down. What do you think happens when you stuff your feelings down? Especially when you've done it your whole life. It's like having a dinner party, and what you made wasn't that good. So you got a lot of leftovers. You put it in your refrigerator, in a Tupperware, and because you're not so hot for it, in time, it gets pushed to the back. You forget about it. But what do you think happens inside that Tupperware over time? At time, it's going to blow up when you least expect it, and it's going to be messy. Okay? Well, that's what happens. And I told this young man, I said, please, bear with me. Do you trust me? <gasps> In that moment, yes. He trusted me. And he did it. But as he's doing this conversation, he's saying, you know, what are you doing to me, Ken? Why are you doing this? I've been in, in like five therapies so far, five treatment houses, and they've never made me do this before. I've never had to get in touch with the pain. Well, do you think maybe that's why you keep relapsing is because you've got to get in there and take that out of the refrigerator and clean it out before it blows up again? As far as I know, he's still sober today. Okay. So with some patients that have the intense pain, everybody's different. Therapy is a process. Some people call it slobriety. Some people, the pain is so deep that I like to equate this with being in a swimming pool. If anybody remembers as a kid daring yourself or your friends to touch the bottom of the swimming pool, you hold your breath and you go down and you only go down part way. But you're proud of yourself because you went down part way, you could see it. Now, in my dysfunctional family, we were told don't go down to the bottom of the swimming pool because Joey down the street had a dog tag on and it got caught on the drain and he drowned and died. My family was full of wonderful bedtime stories like that. <laughs> anyway, screw them, what do they know? I'm going to try it anyway. So I went and I went halfway down, felt great. Next time I went to my grandmother's pool, went down a little bit farther until there was that one day when I just touched the bottom. Even touched the drain. Took a lot of courage. Touched the drain. Came back up real, real quick. Caught my breath. But I did it. A lot of you can probably remember the first time you touched the bottom of the swimming pool, too. And if you were like me, you got to a point where you were sitting cross-legged at the bottom just to see how long you could hold your breath. You mastered it. It didn't kill you. Okay? And that's what happens with this. I've had patients in my office that when I hit that that nerve, just like the dentist drilling and hitting a nerve in your tooth, it's too much. They stop. They jump out of my office. They run down the hall, literally. So I, I'm, I'm sure the other counselors have seen me running in back of them saying, stop, stop, come back, come back. Let's play Scrabble. <laughs> tell me about your woodworking hobby, that door that you just restained. Here, come and tell me. Let's talk about that. We totally don't have to go back down to the swimming pool again. Catch your breath. When you're ready, we'll go down again and we'll try it again. But for right now, let's just come in and just bullshit. Let's build trust. Because you need to get past and realize it is okay to talk. It is okay to feel. It is okay to trust. Okay? I'm not your parent. I'm not your family of origin. I'm not out there to hurt you. The people in your life, a lot of times when we think they're out there to hurt us, are not out there to hurt us. I encourage people to go to 12 steps. That's another pushback I get. You know, how, how, how dare you want me to have an authority figure in my life? Why, why do you want me to do this? Well, therapy and 12 step programs, I like to equate like two different medicines. By and of themselves, they're really not that effective, unfortunately. We're dealing with an illness, whether it be drinking, drugging, or codependency, we're dealing with illness that doesn't have a high success rate. But I've got news for you. You take these two medicines together, and the success rate triples. Okay? It's that important to do both. So you come into recovery. You start moving from hurting to healing. We've educated you. You're getting in touch with your pain. But all of a sudden, you get stuck. This is something I see quite often. Our program is very bottom heavy. We get people that come in that can stay sober for a week, a month, two months, and then all of a sudden we lose people. Sometimes it's because the pink cloud wears off. 
Most people here know what the pink cloud is. It's the newness, the new friends, the new experiences, and then all of a sudden it's not new anymore and we want something more exciting. Or we go back to, to what we know best. Okay? The pink clouds wore off. We, we, we pull away. We go from our old isolation to coming out of isolation to back in a new isolation. Most of us come up with this wonderful new addiction Some people call it the drug with the plug. People develop a couch addiction. Now, if you're in your first week of recovery and you're having major urges and cravings, I want you to sit on your couch. Because if you're sitting on your couch, hopefully you're not going anywhere else to score. But later in your, your recovery, you need to get off your couch. Because to me, recovery is not staying sober, not not doing drugs, not being codependent. Recovery means getting your life back and doing the things that you want to do in life, the things that were robbed of you when you were busy in your affliction. We're still robbed of all that when we're sitting watching somebody else's life for hours and hours and hours and hours. So some people, I actually tell them, you need to turn off the TV for a week. No relapsing. Turn it off for a week. Get rid of it. Turn off your computer. Get your face out of your phone. Live life. Life happens when you get outside and you turn off your TV. A lot of people think that they're okay. I don't need this anymore. I'm good. Okay? That means that you've reached a, pl a place where it, the newness is too scary and you just want to go back to your comfort muck. And then we have something called discomfort with positive states. Discomfort with positive states means things are going really good, but all you know is chaos. All you know is bad self-esteem. So when somebody says nice things to you, looks you in the eye and smiles, says, wow, since you've been in recovery, there's a, there's a glisten in your eye. You know, you are just such a nicer person. We like you so much better now that you're taking care of yourself. Who are you talking to? What do you want from me? The nastiest thing I do to my patients when they're like this in a group session I make everyone in the group give them a compliment. And all they can do is look them in the eye and say thank you. Can't tell you how scary that is for people. But by doing it over and over again, all of a sudden they start to believe it. This is kind of where fake it till you make it comes in. If you put yourself in certain situations long enough, you're going to start to believe things. So that's healing the self-esteem. The other half of it is if you come from a family where there's chaos, and you have brief windows without chaos. I have a friend from Seattle, and when we're traveling and it's raining and there's a blue patch in the sky, he tells me, back in Seattle, we call those sucker holes because you think it's going to clear up. It ain't going to clear up. So out of, out of a dysfunctional family, when there's calm, we know that's a sucker hole. We know not to get too, too excited about it because sooner or later, Dad's going to come back out of prison. Mom's going to start drinking again. Mom's bipolar is going to kick up, and she's going to have to go back to the hospital. I can't get too comfortable because I know doom and gloom is just around the corner. And in recovery, I see people get so anxious every day. You know, this is where one day at a time works against you because one day at a time they get more and more anxious. And I've had people relapse because it's like I just have to get the anxiety out of the way. I know it's going to happen sooner or later. I just want to get it out of the way. So those are things that keep us stuck and move us backwards. So how do we get unstuck? How do we get back into the solution? How do we move out of the isolation into the healing and the helping? Well, like I said, first of all, turn off your television. One thing that I really liked about my, my stay with the Pennsylvania Dutch I didn't stay with the Amish, by the way. I, I've met Amish. They're a little bit different than the people I've stayed with. I've stayed with horse and buggy Mennonites, and I have two uh, Old Order Church of the Brethren families that, I, that I'm associated with. And the thing that makes them so special is their life focuses on two things, faith and family. They don't have time for television because they're busy playing with their kids. They're busy cooking dinner. They're busy working in the fields. Everything revolves around that, and they are some of the happiest people 
that I know. They keep it simple. Our lives aren't simple. How many channels do we have? I don't care how many channels we have. If, if I have a home and garden TV show on, you will never see me again, okay? One channel is enough for me to knock me out for days, okay? Got to keep it simple. Defining moments, those things that, uh, as a kid, shaped us in the wrong direction. We need to create new defining moments. When I was on one of my trips in college, I was having kind of a bad moment. My, my touring companions, they, uh, they, they were, one of them had already dropped out and the other one was dropping out and all of a sudden I was feeling really abandoned and rejected even though I knew that they were leaving not because of me, because of their own accord. And a gentleman came up to me at a, at a church service by the lake in uh, Yellowstone. Elderly gentleman, suit and tie, hat, and we're at an outdoor event, which was kind of odd, but he came up to me and he handed me $20 and said, I believe in young people and I believe in you and I believe in what you're doing and I want you to have lunch on me tomorrow. $20, that was like two days worth of budget, you know? I'm, I just felt so indebted. Why would this person want to help me? And I had a, a, a code that if anybody helped me on the, on the trip, I would get their name and address, and I would send them a postcard at the end to let them know I got there safely. He refused. He says, I don't need that. He says, I believe in young people, and I believe in you, and I believe in what you're doing. A new defining moment. So in recovery, we need to have new defining moments. And guess what? We don't get them when we're in front of the, the drug with the plug. And unfortunately, for all the bad defining moments that created all the pain and suffering, we need a hell of a lot more new ones to break those old beliefs. But you need to get out there and give yourself the opportunity to have those defining moments. On the handout I gave everybody, there's a picture. There's an ACA, um, I don't know if it's, if it's a group or people get together. It's a kind of a, um, an assignment that people do where they bring in a picture of themselves when they were young. Their third grade picture, their high school picture. Usually in our pictures we're smiling and the assignment is to come in and talk about the pain that's in back of the picture. I noticed as an adult, I was going over to friends' houses, and there's all these pictures of them with their family and their friends, and they all seem to be having so much fun. And I felt like, why is my life not like that? Why don't I have pictures of my friends and family around, around my house? Because I wanted to have the opportunity to do that. I wanted my life to be like their picture. And then I realized the reason why I don't have pictures like that is because in my circle of friends and in my family, I'm the one holding the camera. Okay? And once I realized that, I learned to take selfies the right way. And to take these pictures and to put them where I can see them to remind myself that I'm part of the bigger picture. So I challenge people to do that assignment themselves, to start surrounding yourself with people. If you've met new people at this convention and you don't mind breaking anonymity with each other to take selfies, get as many pictures of each other to remember this by. You might have made some lasting friendships and relationships this weekend. Okay? It's a new beginning, a new growth. Staying out of isolation, staying in the moment, one way to do it is to have gratitude. They've done studies with happy people, and the one thing that happy people all have in common, they have a long list of gratitude. A lot of assignments that I know sponsors give people is to every morning when you wake up, like three or five things down that you're grateful for. Do it specifically. Don't say, I'm grateful for my children. Say, I'm grateful for Johnny, and I'm grateful that, that he's great at sports. I'm grateful that every morning when I wake up, he smiles at me, and, and he starts my day that way. Be as specific as you can, and put your gratitude list somewhere where you can see it. If it's tucked somewhere where you can't, when you're having a bad moment, you're going to forget about it. Put it on your refrigerator, put it near your bathroom window, put it somewhere where you can see it to remind yourself of what we have. I work for an organization where... Um, I don't work. I volunteer for an organization that's international. And I've met a lot of people that have a lot less than we do. I was in Europe a few years ago. When I came back from Europe, our gas prices have gone up to over $4 a gallon. And everybody was screaming and complaining about how horrible Obama is that we have such high gas prices. 
my first thought was, you know, why are, why are you blaming somebody? Our nature, we need to blame somebody. The other thing is gas in, in Italy was $7 a gallon, and we're complaining about $4 a gallon. It's like almost half as much, and we're complaining. Where's our gratitude? And, of course, I'm saying this as I'm riding my bicycle to work three days a week. But I'm grateful that I'm healthy enough to do that. I'm grateful that I live in Southern California where I have the weather to do that all year round. I'm grateful that I live close enough to work to do that. I have my gratitude. So really, work towards, towards getting gratitude. That's where you come into the healing and start moving into the helping. Give back. Start sponsoring, volunteer, volunteer for a, 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 a hotline. Uh, I know a lot of the local like AA and NA groups, they need people to, to man the phones from time. Give back. Give back to your community. And play. Our inner child, we've, we've forgotten how to play. And in just a minute, I'm going to have you stand up and, and join me in some play as we wrap this up. But if you have kids or grandkids, get down on your knees with them. Get down to their level. Learn how to play at their level. Introduce yourself to their games. Make sure that you touch into that inner child in yourself to play with them. Play is so important. And fake it till you make it. And I know in ACA, we've worn masks our whole life. So what are you telling me to fake it? I've been faking it my whole life. But I know when I was traveling, I had a certain sense of self-esteem. And I kind of gave him a name. His name was Mr. Tour. And Mr. Tour was able to knock on farmhouse doors and had the courage to say, hey, I'm traveling cross-country and there's nowhere to camp around here. Can I pitch my tent somewhere in your field? I had the courage to do that. And a lot of times, the rejection that I got was, why the hell would you want to do that? We have a perfectly good guest bedroom here. Bessie, set another place at the table. We got company tonight. You know, wonderful things changed the way I saw myself, okay? So when I wasn't traveling, I strived to be Mr. Tour. Because without the, the shield of dirt on me that, that was so comfortable with, it was harder for me to be that person to have the self-esteem. But after doing it for so many years, striving to be that person when I wasn't traveling, I woke up one day and I realized not only had I become that person in my everyday life, but I surpassed him. Okay. So these are the tools that I hope that you can live by to keep yourself unstuck and helping. So in conclusion, living in the solution is to become your own loving parent. The solution to get past your childhood pain is the choice to challenge your old belief system and create a new today. The solution is to protect your inner child with the shield of love. The solution is to take a time out, to breathe and focus. The solution is to take God's hand and let him walk you through the storm. The solution is to take assistance and sometimes ask for help. The solution is to get rid of judgment because without judgment, you cannot have shame or fear. The solution is to play with all your heart and all your soul. So if it's raining tonight, go outside and feel the raindrops. And the solution is to fake it till you make it.